right, we're back in First Kings, doing God's Game of Thrones, and we're finally going to look at Ahab, and we've talked about Ahab a little bit, but I've not really introduced you to Ahab, King Ahab. Ahab means brother of father. His length of reign is 22 years, and that brother of father is like uncle. So length of reign, 22 years, spiritual state is evil father's name Omri his prophet is Elijah and some other unknown prophets he ruled during the 30th year of Asa and continues into the reign of Jehoshaphat Asa and Jehoshaphat would be the kings of Judah and Ahab is the king of Israel now the verses are 1st Kings 16 through 21 chapter 16 through 21 2nd Kings 3 5 and 2nd Chronicles 18 through 19 and the title of this is going to be Ahab Has Problems. Have you ever been around somebody that was crazy and uh, you look at them and say, Hey man, you've got some problems. you got problems. If you was around Ahab, you'd say, Hey, you've got some problems. And he had a lot of problems. The first one is he won't protect his own. In 1 Kings 20, 1 through 4, listen real close to this story. And Benadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria, and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, and to the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Benadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. And the king of Israel... Now watch what Ahab says. And the king of Israel answered. Ahab says, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. So this guy Benadad sends messengers to tell Ahab that his wife, his children, his silver and gold are his. And Ahab's like, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. Ahab won't protect his own. He's a coward. Instead of saying, over my dead body, instead of saying, I'd like to see you try to take my family and my stuff, instead of saying, Benadad, you must have a death wish, he said, according to thy saying, O king, it's all yours. You know, this is a strange thing. If somebody said, your wife is my wife to me, I'd say, when hell freezes over, man, I'd say, over my dead body, I'd say, do you want to die or are you just stupid? But Ahab wouldn't protect his own. And 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I believe that would include protection and not just financially protection. But, I mean, just, I mean, you got to provide not just a home and food, but you got to provide protection for your family. He won't protect his own. Now, the next thing is he's worried about his stuff. I mean, he he was gonna, he would spare some silver and gold, but when it comes right down to it, he wants his stuff, and that's what makes him stand up to Benadad here. In First Kings twenty five through six, it says, and the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Benadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children. Yet will I send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house, and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. Ahab was okay with the king having his wife and family. He was okay with Benadad having some silver and gold, but when it come to the stuff in his house and his servants' houses, he finally had enough of what Benadad had to say. And the problem Benadad had was covetousness. He wanted Ahab's wife. He wanted everything in his house. And what did the Lord say back in Exodus 20 and verse 17? He said, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. What you have with Benadad, king of Syria, is a man that can't be satisfied with anything ever. And this is the problem with rulers today. They can't be satisfied. That's why men start unrighteous wars. They want more money, more power, more women, more stuff. In James 4, 1 and 2, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Whence come wars and fightings among you? 
Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members ye lust, and have not, ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight, and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. That's why un unrighteous wars ha ha start. They start them because they're wanting something that ain't theirs. In First Kings 20 and verse 7, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land. So Ahab calls all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man, Benadad, seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, and for my children, and for my silver, and for my gold. Now look at this, and I denied him not. They probably thought, how dumb are you, Ahab? They probably said, you denied him not. Are you a traitor? Don't you care about your family and your people? Ahab cared only about his self and his stuff. He knew it was going a little too far now, and he wasn't going to have any of his stuff. But the fact that he said, I deny not, made his words become a joke. And 1 Kings 20, verses 8 through 9 says, And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Should they even have to tell their king this? Shouldn't he have enough sense? It says, Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Benadad, Tell my lord the king, All that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. You're going to see that what Ahab says now to the messengers of Benadad are a joke. His words became a joke because of what he said the first time. You're going to find that when Benadad got word from his messengers that Ahab wasn't going to have it now, Ahab's words were just a joke now. Rightfully so, because look at what Ahab said the first time. He agreed with Benadad that his family and wife were his. Benadad probably thought, what a little chump. What, what is he even thinking? He's just going to let me come and say, you know, that the, your wife is mine, your children are mine. His words became a joke. And next, he has wisdom without understanding. What you're about to see is Ahab use his wisdom. He had some wisdom. I mean, he probably read Solomon's Proverbs, but he didn't have any understanding. And he really didn't have that much wisdom. He just had some little sayings, you know. He didn't have that much wisdom, seeing as how he has no fear of God before his eyes. He's got some good quotes, kind of like men today. They have some good quotes, but they lack wisdom because they deny God. Job twenty-eight twenty-eight says, And unto man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. First Kings 20 and verse 10, And Benadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so to me, do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. So Benadad is so confident that he believes he can have Ahab and his people turned to handfuls of dust. And he thinks he's going to cream them or cremate them. But look what Ahab says, and it's a good quote I like. In 1 Kings 20 and verse 11, And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. Look at that. Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. He's saying, Don't let the man who's getting ready for war brag like the one that just finished the war. Don't walk around like you're going to win a fight. Wait till the fight's over. And you have you you can rejoice, but the MMA fighters have it all wrong. They showboat on the way out of the tunnel, and the fight hasn't even started. It's foolish. Before you go through a battle, tell God you're weak. Tell God you're no good. Tell Him you can't do it without Him. Don't showboat before the fight like you've done did the fight. Galatians six three says, "For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself." Then after you win the fight. Give God the glory, but don't, don't, uh, it says, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. The one that's putting on the harness is going to war. The one that putteth it off has already went to war and made it through the war. He's the one that's, that should be rejoicing. First Kings 20 and verse 12, And it came to pass when Benadad heard the message as he was drinking, he and the kings in the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array. And they set themselves in array against the city. Ahab is a fool, but at least he isn't drinking like Benadad at a time like this. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 and verse 1, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not 
wise. Ahab had a little bit of wisdom. He had some good quotes, we'll say that. He had no understanding, none. He had no idea how to depart from evil. Benadad was even dumber. What you have is dumb and dumber, the king's edition here. He and his men were so overconfident, they were drinking themselves drunk. They were like Conor McGregor, walking around like they are God's gift to himself. It's like they think that God made them as a gift to himself. But they soon find out in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Ahab had a little bit of wisdom, but no understanding. Ahab witnessed the miracles of God and rejects him anyway. That's the next point. First Kings 20 and verse 13. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So Elijah isn't talking to Ahab right now, but another mysterious prophet shows up, and this prophet has a message that this great multitude of enemies that, are, that follow Benadad will be delivered into the hand of Ahab. Why would God deliver Ahab's enemies into his hand when Ahab is a jerk? Well, it gives Ahab another chance to witness the miracles of God, just like he saw Elijah defeat the 400-and-something prophets of Baal. In Romans 2, 4 says, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. He's trying to lead Ahab to repentance. Second Peter three nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long suffering. First Kings twenty, fourteen and fifteen, and Ahab said by whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were two hundred and thirty-two, and after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being seven thousand. So Ahab was going to send in the two thirty-two first, and then seven thousand next. First Kings twenty sixteen, and they went out at noon, but Benadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the thirty and two kings that helped him. So he isn't going to be making very good judgment calls drinking so much, you see. In 1 Kings twenty seventeen, And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Benadad sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria. And the young men that went out first were the 232 men. And he said, Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive. Or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. He wants to take them prisoner. It may be turn them into slaves and servants. But it's stupid for him to tell them to take them alive. First Kings twenty nineteen. So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city and the army which followed them. So 232 came out and then the other 7,000. And it says, And they slew everyone his man, and the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. And Benadad, the king of Syria, escaped on an horse with the horsemen. So they went from being confident Benadad went from being confident to running with a tail between his legs. He was overconfident. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. So Ahab witnesses the power of God. He sees his small army get the best of a great multitude, yet Ahab still doesn't turn to God. He witnesses the miracles of God, but doesn't turn to God. And next, he's warned by prophets once more. 1 Kings twenty twenty two And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. So he's warning him again, that it will happen again. I always remember that when the victory is over, you will have another battle on your hands sooner or later. So you might as well stay right with God even after a victory. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills, therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. So the servants of Benadad are like, Israel and Ahab's gods are gods of the hills. So that's that why they won. If we can get them on a plain, on the plain, then we can win. The Syrians were so foolish. They thought God was just a god of the hills. They didn't understand that God is God no matter where he's at. Someone may, might say, well, how are you going to cuss in church? How are you going to act like that in church? 
well, you shouldn't act like that anywhere. You shouldn't cuss anywhere. God is the same God in church as he is outside of church. God is not limited to a certain location. He made the hills. He made the plain. He made the mountains. He made the oceans. Psalm 90 and verse 12, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God would win against a lion in the jungle. He would win against sharks and whales in the ocean. He could win against Conor McGregor in the octagon, even though he thinks he can beat Jesus. I mean, he could snap both of his legs just by looking at him. 1 Kings twenty twenty four. And do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. So they tell the king of Syria to get rid of the kings and other men because they were weak. They were given to pleasure. And they say put captains in their place. So the people they were going to, men they were put in place would have been men of skill, men who were expert in war. And they say, and number thee an army, like the army that thou lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. So they want to fight in the plain, because horses and chariots would do better there than in hills and mountains. Now, uh, once again, you're going to see Ahab witness miracles from God in 1 Kings 20, 26 through 27. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them the two, pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. So they were like two little flocks of kids. There were like two little flocks of goats versus a great multitude. And it says, but the Syrians filled the country. You see, God likes to take something little like Ahab and his army and show his power by having them overcome something big. It's like you are out at the park or something. You're a little guy and a bunch of big bullies come up to beat you up. But then your big brother comes up behind you, picks you up, and swings you around, helicopter kicking all your bullies down as they're gathered around you. That's what it's like. God picks Israel up and helicopter kicks thousands of enemies that greatly outnumber them. And uh, it may look like Israel is doing something big, but it's really God that's doing something big. First Kings twenty twenty eight, And there came a man of God, and spake unto the king of Israel, and said, Thus saith the Lord, Because the Syrians have said the Lord is the God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. God will sometimes pay attention to stuff that stupid people say. He said, Since they think I'm just the God of the hills, then let's change home courts and stomp them there too. And it says in verse 29, And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined. And the children of Israel slew of the Syrians and a hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek and to the city. And there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Benadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. So this is a big wall. If God doesn't use an army to kill them, then he can use objects to kill them. He did the same thing for Joshua with a hailstorm coming down on the enemy. I mean, if Ahab was honest, he would look at this event and say, This is a miracle of God I'm witnessing. There's no way I would have won unless God helped me. He had so many signs that he should turn to the Lord his God and tell Jezebel to jump in the lake and swallow a snake and then come up with a bellyache, as Danny Castle said many times. But Ahab, he's witnessed the miracles of God. Now the next thing, he's worse than a traitor. The thing about Ahab is that he not only witnessed miracles, but he still turns out worse than a traitor anyway. It says in 1 Kings 20 and verse 31, And his servants said unto him, To Benadad king of Assyria, behold now. So he's saying, they're saying this to Benadad the king of Syria, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure he will save thy life. So they have heard that Israel is merciful because their God is a God of mercy. So they're going to take a, they're going to fake a sincere heart and put sackcloth on and act as if they have a change of heart because they've been beat, you see. And lost people do this to us today. You know, they think since you're a Christian that you're gullible and you're merciful and you're, you're obligated to be taken advantage of and ran over. 
And if you don't do what they request, they say, well, I thought you were a Christian. They pull the Christian card. Man, I thought you was a Christian. A Christian would, would do this for me. A Christian would go drop me off at the liquor store. A Christian would give me a hundred bucks so I could go fulfill my pill habit. You know how they do. First Kings twenty thirty two. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Let thy servant Benadad, thy servant Benadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Look at Ahab. He said, Is he yet alive? Talking about Benadad. He is my brother. Ahab has got some problems. He's worse than a traitor. This king and his people just came at his people and his wife and his kids to take them and kill them. And Ahab says, is he yet alive? He's my brother. That guy ain't his brother. He wanted him dead. 1 Kings 20, 33 through 34. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, thy brother Benadad, then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Benadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. So Ahab pulls up next to Benadad, and he's like, Get up, come on in this chariot. And Benadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. Once again, never make covenants with the world. They will always burn you. You have a covenant with the Lord, and that's it. God never wanted his people making covenants with wicked men. Now, once again, Ahab's going to get warned by the prophets. He's going to get a talking to by the prophets. And here is a very interesting object lesson that you're going to see with this prophet here. Verse 35, And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord. Notice that, in the word of the Lord. He comes up to this guy and starts talking to him in the word of the Lord. And he says to the man, Smite me, I pray thee. He comes up to him and tells him to hit him. And the man refused to smite him. What if your preacher came up to you today and told you to smack him upside the head? Would you do it? Most of us, say, most of us would say, No way, I'm not smacking a preacher in the face. This man refuses to smite the prophet. But remember, the prophet told him to do it in the word of the Lord. So the man went against the word of God for not smacking the prophet. Verse 36, Then he said unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. What a story. This should remind you that when a preacher is clearly speaking by the word of the Lord, you better do what he says or the lion who is walking about seeking whom he, may, whom he may devour is going to get you. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting he wounded him. So this guy obeys the word of the Lord. It says, So the prophet departed and waited for the king, talking about Ahab, by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. So he is being a master of disguise. He gets wounded in the face and puts ashes on his face as a disguise to make it look like, you know, he's a soldier that's been in war. And it says in verse 39, And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. So this prophet is using the illustration that the same way a soldier pays a big price for losing a prisoner in war is the same way that Ahab is going to pay for letting Benadad go. Now look at verse 40. Look at what Ahab's going to say. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. So he's saying that, you know, since you let the guy go, then shall thy life be for his life. So he's saying that man has to pay with his life. But by Ahab saying that, he's judged himself for letting Benadad go. And so it says, And he hasted... This is the, the prophet now. It says, And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned, discerned him that he was of the prophet. So Ahab realized, Well, man, this is one of the prophets. So the prophet knew that Ahab 
he, he wouldn't get an honest answer from Ahab if Ahab knew he was a prophet. So that's why he disguised himself. Now look at what the prophet says. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, which would be Benadad, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. So since Ahab let Benadad go, it will be his life for his life, and his people for his people. So the same way that soldier... The illustra in that illustration, the soldier let that prisoner go. That soldier would have had to die. Ahab has to die for letting Benadad go when Benadad was appointed to, to destruction by God. And it says, And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. So Ahab believed that it was going to happen because he went to his house heavy and displeased. He knew that he went against the word of God.